Welcome to Soul Adventure TV, where we explore what may very well be an unprecedented opportunity in humanity's spiritual and physical evolution, and the choices standing before each and every individual to walk on this grand adventure or not. Do we really know who and what we are and what we can choose to be? I'm your host and fellow soul adventurer, Steve Crow. Our guest today is Jen Aramith. For over 10 years, she's worked as a channel and Akashic Records consultant, helping people develop a connection with the wisdom found within this striking repository of knowledge. Jen holds a master's degree in communication and publishes a website, akashictransformations.com, where she maintains an extensive collection of Akashic Records channelings focused on expanding our understanding of the world we share while inspiring hope, empowerment, and love. Welcome, Jen, to Soul Adventure TV. Thanks, Steve. I'm glad to be here. Well, for those of uh, uh, our listeners uh, not already familiar with uh, your work, can you give us a little bit about your journey and how you became an, an Akashic Records consultant? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, the first thing I'll say is I certainly didn't plan this. As a little girl, I didn't think I'm going to grow up to be a channeler. <laughs> uh, but, you know, life takes us where it does. And for me, the journey probably began uh, in earnest uh, when I went to massage therapy school. And I did that in order to become a healer and get in touch with my own healing abilities, but mostly to put myself through graduate school. My plan was always to be a professor. And so... Um, as I went through graduate school and got a master's degree, I worked as a massage therapist on the side. And so I had this really interesting convergence of the very rational approach of graduate school. I was studying communication theory and on the other side, doing massage therapy and finding myself having some very powerful and intuitive experiences through that work. And uh, at some point, a friend introduced me to the idea of the Akashic Records. And, you know, I had always been more of a scientist than anything else in my life. And so I took a very scientific approach to it. She offered to do a reading for me. And so I um, wrote down some questions that she couldn't make up the answer for. And I sort of tested her. And really, I walked away from that reading that she did with me with my jaw on the floor. Um, and so that caused me to really consider that channeling is a real thing. It really works. And so when I had a chance, I took a short course, like a weekend workshop on working with the Akashic Records just for myself. Uh, it was a it was a workshop focused on channeling, but really getting answers for myself to enrich my own life. And then over time, people asked me to do readings for them. And it took me over a year before I agreed to do that because, because I'm a scientist at heart. I take it very seriously to consider that I'm speaking on behalf of someone's spirit. And so eventually when I decided to give this a try, I, um, I wrote an internship for myself and I tested it. And for 30 days, I did one reading a day for a friend of a friend, people I didn't know well, and I asked them to test me. And really at that point, um, I thought this was just kind of a hobby and a fun little thing, but it turned out that those people came back for more readings and they referred their friends and it completely sidetracked me from getting a PhD, which had been my plan. <laughs> so it's about um, 11 years later and I'm still doing readings. Well, help us understand uh, what the Akashic Records basically are. Um, is it a library of sorts, or or when, where, or even when is it? <laughs> That's a great question and a fun way to ask it. Uh, there are so many metaphors that can describe the Akashic Records, and all of them are right. People often use the word library because that's, you know, in, in our world, in the physical world, that's kind of the best way to describe a repository of information or a place to get all the answers. Um, so library is a great word, but it is still a metaphor. Um, and the real, the real answer to where or when the Akashic Records are is they're everywhere. Um, and they're all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's really hard to grasp. And so... Um, you know, I think of that library as being a non-physical thing because it is. And then I imagine as a non-physical thing, it can be tiny or huge. And so in some ways, I like to think that the Akashic Records are in all of our cells and they're in the world around us. And we and, and, and I also like to think of the Akashic Records as a radio signal. You can if we if that's a radio signal with information flying around all the time, we have our own built in radio receivers and we just tune into different things all the time. And I think that metaphor extends not only to the Akashic 
records, but to everyday life. You know, we tune into fear, we tune into love, that sort of thing. And so um, one thing about the Akashic Records that I found to be absolutely true every time I work with them in any way is that they are identified by love. Um, they always feel like love. The information is always loving. And the way I know that I've tapped in, you know, I have a process to access the records. And when I go through that process, it's a prayer and a little meditation. Um, the moment I know that I've entered the records, whether it's the records of a person or a topic, I know because I've completely fall in love with whatever it is. And often I feel a sense like I miss that person, even though I've never met them and I've never even seen them before. I suddenly miss them though, like they're my long last sister. And so um, for me, the tangible experience of the records is always love. Yeah, uh, I hear that uh, that term, you know, frequency or vibration of love throughout the the, the spiritual uh, uh, topic. You know, it, I think it's it's just so important, and, it, and it's it's the primary thing that I think we're all trying to, you know, connect with. Um, if if we extend the library metaphor a little bit uh, further, without breaking it too much, are are, are there uh, are there librarians, people who manage or somehow um, work in in the library? Yeah. yeah, in the library. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Um, using the metaphor, it's not as direct as the metaphor implies, of course, but uh, there seem to be beings who officially keep the Akashic Records. I call them the keepers, just to, just so we can identify them. Um, and so on my website, you'll see references to the keepers. And I'm talking about these beings that are spirits, just like your spirit or my spirit, but they're not living as humans. They're not living physically because they're very busy keeping the Akashic Records. And it, so they're, I think of them as capital K keepers, you know, that's their one and only job, they're experts. Um, but then there are countless small K keepers. And those are mostly the spirit guides of human beings. I've, um, I've taken a lot of looks at this by accessing the records of the records themselves and trying to figure out from that perspective and also just doing readings for individuals. It's evident that each of us, when we become human, um, part of the package is we get a set of spirit guides and some people get a lot and some people get a few and it's always what you need. And so the, one of the jobs or one of the roles those personal spirit guides play is they keep our records for us. You know, they make sure that the information about our soul that we need to share with people in relationship to us gets shared and that the things that we don't want to share gets kept inside. And so um, there are keepers at a lot of different levels, but there do seem to be these, these really high level beings who are in charge of the Akashic records overall. How detailed do these records get? I mean, does it cover individual experiences only or mainly, or is it a, does it also have broader topics in there? Uh, uh, all, oh. all of the above. And in my experience, really, the only limit to the detail is how much, how, how how finely tuned my mind can be as far as channeling it. Um, but really, in, in the records themselves, I think everything, absolutely everything is held. And that's one of the things that's so hard to comprehend. You know, every time you sneeze, it's held in your records just as well as, you know, the time you saved someone's life or, you know, the time you mastered reincarnation or whatever it might be. All those things are held because all of those things are important. You know, you know, the more I've looked at the records and the more I've spent time channeling, the more I can see that everything matters, that nothing is a meaningless coincidence, even if it's whether you sneezed a minute ago or now, there's a reason for it. Now, I can't think about it that much because then I can't handle my life. You know, it's too much to handle. But, um, but really, every little thing is in the records. And the way it's organized is based on the themes that matter to our soul's journey. It's not organized chronologically. And that can be frustrating sometimes. People often ask in a, in a personal reading, they ask, what was my last lifetime? And occasionally I can see that, but most of the time I can't. Where if they ask, you know, how have I worked on compassion, then I can see a perfect order of how they've worked on it, regardless of whether it's chronological. And um, if I have an experience of the keepers as I'm channeling, um, you know, and I try to look at it in a, in a, in a human order, like chronologically, they shrug and like, like talk <laughs> That doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. <laughs> uh, what matters is the theme and how we're learning and, and what we're working with. And so it's always organized that way. How does the information get put into the records? 
Mm -hmm. Ooh, you know, I don't know for sure, but uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever asked that when I've done a channeling on the record. So what can I say about channeling? But um, my thought about that is that if the records are not separate from us, then there's, there's not really a mechanism to put them there. They are there the moment they occur. Um, they're in the same way that a thought is a part of me and the words I'm saying are a part of me and my records are a part of me there. It's all, it's already, um, it's already one. If that, so that's my thought about it, but I'd love to do a channeling on that very question. So thanks for the idea. <laughs> oh, no problem. You know, you mentioned the, 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 uh, struggle that we have, uh, with linear, our concepts of linear time and how that really doesn't, isn't, um, maybe perhaps as valid as we think. So when you're looking at what we here might call a future event, I'm always kind of wondering, well, which future is it that you're seeing? Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of chances to look at this, and it's pretty fun uh, to think about the future, especially in our world, because we have free will here. So there is no single future, as, as you've implied in your question. And so the future I'm looking at is dependent on the, the person asking and what they're asking for. So when I see the future in the records, whether it's the future for an individual or the future for a topic, you know, I do I do larger topics for the, you know, the collective. Um, either way, the future um, is never a single line. It's always always um, a road that branches out and it might branch into a million possibilities or two. And it depends on how clearly we've planned. Our souls are always planning individually and collectively. And so we're always kind of narrowing down the choices. Um, but there's always choice. The choice remains until we make it. And so, um, so often when someone asks about a future occurrence, what I'll see are the probabilities. Like here's the direction your soul is taking. Um, here's why. Here's what it might take to change it if you want to. Here are the consequences of, of going with the probability or changing to a, a different possibility. Um, and often people, they have an idea of what they're hoping for or dreading in their future. So they're, they, they ask more specific questions. You know, what are the benefits if I take that path or this path? Um, so I never really look at one future because there isn't one, but just to be able to convey any information about that infinite future, um, I look at the probabilities based on how a soul has its plans in order at that point in time. Well, you brought up the example of someone asking, um, you know, what, what might occur if I choose path A versus path B? Well, let's say they choose path A. What happens to path B? Um, I, there are a couple of ways I can answer this. And, um, one of them is really hard to comprehend even for me. And it's the more honest answer. And the other is the kind of human version that we can deal with. <laughs> <laughs> well, give us and, both. We'll, we'll play with I them both. both. Yeah. So, um, the kind of human version that I live with, you know, and, um, that most of us can kind of comprehend and deal with is that it just goes away. You know, it's not the path we're on, therefore it doesn't exist. And there's certainly truth to that as as long as we're living in a third dimensional world, um, we're only in the present moment. Anything else is just an idea. And we've heard in many different spiritual teachers talk about that fact. And so in that sense, there is no other path exists. It just disappears. Uh, but what I've seen in the records and tried to comprehend time and again is that those paths unfold as well. We're just not participating in them from this third dimensional human life that we're in. And I think for a small number of people, it's important to comprehend that, figure it out, think about it, make sense of it. Uh, but for most of us, it's far more important that we stay present with the life that we're living. Um, I, I know I've fallen into this trap and I've seen lots of people do it, you know, where we, we can get lost in all the possibilities and never really ground ourselves in what we're meant to be doing here or what we have chosen for here. And then none of those possibilities, even the one we're in, really goes very well. So um, so both those things are true in a sense. It's just a human perspective or a cosmic perspective. So Jen, many people are convinced that we are living in very special times. And, and we look towards December of this year with particular interest. What have your readings revealed to you about the likely events surrounding December 21st, 2012? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. A question a lot of people have, definitely. Um, you know, 
about four or five years ago, I started seeing information about 2012 in the Akashic Records that really said that some of the things we were anticipating for December of 2012 were actually beginning then, like in 2007, 2008. Um, the year 2012 was energetically beginning already. And so there are some, I've seen a few things about December itself, but for the most part, what I've seen about 2012 in the Akashic Records is that this is a period of time that's larger than a year. And that um, the idea of 2012 as a year itself um, is artificial, right? Human beings created a calendar and, and said a year starts here, it ends there. Um, and so the energy of this transition that 2012 and bodies is just so much bigger than 365 days could contain. And so something I, you know, I do a channeling on each year as it comes. Every September or October, I do a live public channeling um, where we access the records of the coming year and then people can ask questions about it. And um, so it, when I did the channeling for 2009, back in the fall of 2008, the, the keepers of the Akashic Records announced that 2012 was beginning right then, <laughs> you know, Know, like that energetically and for all intents and purposes and as far as everything people were going to experience in 2012 it was already beginning there was nothing left to wait for there was nothing left to fear about it it's just time to roll up your sleeves and get going and so in that same way um they've implied, and I assume it's true, it only makes logical sense, that the energy of 2012 will probably continue. It'll linger for a few years. You know, it's just like a bell curve. It's going up slowly. It goes down slowly. And so right here in 2012 and December 21st, um, you might think of it as the top of that curve, but um, it's all still the same material and the same process. And I think that's a really important thing, I think, and I've also seen in the records, it's an important thing for us to remember about these metaphysical ideas that for all the metaphysical ideas and our expanding consciousness and awareness of cosmic information, we're still going through all of it as humans. And so it still follows a human, like a human process that we can handle. Otherwise we wouldn't sign on for it. And so in that way, what I've seen in the records that there's, there's not a catastrophe, a catastrophe written for December 21st. And there's also not um, a sudden enlightenment or relief for um, all our earthly troubles. Um, I actually, they, I did a reading on enlightenment a few months ago and the keepers themselves named it, they subtitled it, um, this is not an escape hatch, I think is what they wanted to call it. I didn't name it that officially because it was kind of a funny title, but that's what they wanted to call it. Um, so, you know, we're not going to be saved and we're not going to be doomed necessarily at, at a single point in time. Uh, but the choices we've been making in the last couple of years and the choices we'll make in the next couple of years have a higher potency than they may have 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, in that sense, humanity is at a turning point at which, um, you know, it's in our survival is in our hands as a human and race. And um, so according to the keepers of the records, what the Mayans foresaw was accurate in that the time for humanity to be as humanity was, is done. We have to be different if we're going to survive. And the keepers of the records say that. Um, it's kind of written in our cosmic contract. And, you know, environmentalists say that too, and ec economists and all sorts of people are saying it because it's it, it applies to all of those parts of our, our collective lives. And so that seems to be what 2012 is all about. And um, according to the keepers, it, or the perspective I've gotten from the keepers is that it would be unfair um, to set it up where we have to get it right on one day. It's not fair. <laughs> That's no. part of a game for humans to play. And um, so we're not in that kind of pressure cooker position, but because so many people either fear or look forward to that date, some things will probably happen. <laughs> um, you know, we create our own reality. And so in that sense, you might see some events. And in that sense, there is an added intensity that wasn't there in the original contract. You know, humans have changed the soul contract for 2012 and made it more intense by, um, by putting their hopes and dreams or all their fears onto the idea of it. So um, if we look at it in more terms of a process that's ongoing, where do you think this process is leading us or are we leading ourselves towards? Maybe it's a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I have some of my own thoughts about where I think it's leading us, but uh, what I've seen in the records is that uh, it's leading us to a new way of being human. And the best way I can describe that new way of being human is that it's um, it's becoming possible slowly but surely for human beings to live a, hu a full human life in a physical body without completely forgetting who we were before we were born. That's becoming possible. And the way the keepers describe it um, it's kind of exciting and scary whenever I'm in the records and I really look at this, that, you know, the fact is that our bodies are physical matter, but that physical matter can be energy. You know, Einstein and other physicists have, have demonstrated that matter and energy can be interchangeable. They trade places. And therefore, um, every atom that makes up the molecules in every cell of my body um, is there by choice. And part of that choice is my cosmic contract to live as a human. And when I made that choice, I had to forget who I really was. I had to forget my soul and my previous lifetimes, because if I remembered all of that, I, um, that, that choice to stay here in this body, um, gets harder. <laughs> I could, you know, theoretically we could just twinkle out. We could just turn into energy and disappear. And so, um, in order to keep us safe in a sense in our human lives and in our human bodies, the forgetting was necessary to be human. So slowly but surely, as more people try to comprehend more of these things and try to deal with the things that hold us back, um, you know, our emotional baggage, our wounds, our past life karma, um, as we work through that stuff and lighten up, it becomes possible for us to remember more of our past lives, um, to do things like lucid dreaming or spontaneous healing. Those things become more possible because the, the choice to stay in our bodies is no longer something that's just locked in and a habit but it becomes something we consciously decide to do as we go. And so in that, that's, that's a way the keepers have described the new kind of human. And it's not possible for us to just become that all of a sudden. If you try to do that, you lose your grounding in, in your body and your life. And so while a lot of people are really excited to go fast with this process, um, it goes a lot better if we move slowly or if we move at our own pace and trust that that pace is exactly what it's meant to be. And that's one of the most common messages I get um, from the keepers uh, is to, you know, trust your pace, trust the things that come to your life as being exactly the thing that you're meant to work with. And it's easy to, for us, all of us to, to nod our head and think, yeah, that's true, but it's hard. You know, mm -hmm. when life sticky, it's nice to think that we could just be enlightened and not feel so bad anymore. Even I fall into that trap sometimes, but, um, but it really is true. Every time I've looked in the records, I've never seen someone who was completely off track and is supposed to be moving faster with enlightenment. You know, no one's failing that class. Everyone's just going through the process in their own way. Well, do you think that this new human, maybe this new body that we may be creating for ourselves, do you think it'll be possible for us to hold more of our true divinity here on the 3D plane as this, as this uh, new human evolves? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's absolutely the point of it. And, um, you know, uh, the keepers, I don't know if they've said that precisely, but it's implied. You know, if we remember more of who we are, then we remember our divinity. And some of the ways the keepers have described what that looks like in everyday life for human beings in the future is that um, not so much that everyone's perfect, uh, though there are a lot of ideas about that in different, you know, religions and other groups, but more that the more you remember who you really are, the more you recognize that you are divinely and completely interconnected with everyone and everything else. And therefore, um, hurting your hurting someone else is hurting yourself and you can feel it as such where uh, uh, the former way of being human the way we used to be and still are in some ways we have to learn that hurting someone else is bad for us you know we have to learn it as kind of an abstract concept because we experience ourselves as being so separate from each other but as we remember our divinity and we sense ourselves as being more of our soul or our spirit. Uh, I, it, what I felt in the records when I feel into that future is I, I can feel how it would actually hurt me to hurt somebody. It's not just an idea. And so that people become better, not because they're trying harder, but because they just have information about who they are that makes harm obviously harmful or love obviously helpful. Um, so in that way, life will probably be quite a bit easier. Um, 
but in some other ways it will be harder, especially if we move too fast. You know, there's a reason that we forget so much of who we are. It's hard to comprehend all of that, and it's hard to deal with all those details, and it's hard to feel the pain of the world, to feel that connection and be aware of how someone hurting on the other side of the planet does hurt me. You know, it's hard to feel that. And so, again, um, the keepers over and over again say, take this at your own pace. There's no hurry. Um, it's not going to make your life better to rush forward into a higher understanding standing if you haven't dealt with the things sitting on your lap right now. As you've been doing your uh, personal Akashic Records channelings or readings for individuals, are you starting to notice any new patterns emerging? Yes. Yeah, you know, there tend to be patterns over and over. Um, yeah, there, you know, there, there are a couple patterns this year and, uh, there's one I've just noticed. I just started noticing it in, in August. And, you know, when you notice a pattern, then you look back and realize it's been going on for a while before you noticed it. So I think it probably started in July or June, but, um, I've noticed a pattern where I've seen that this, uh, a similar message for a lot of individuals and individual readings. And, um, almost always when I do the monthly, uh, public channelings that I do, and no matter what the topic, um, I've done a couple different topics this summer uh, but no matter what the topic a similar phrase pops up um, and it's that you're trying too hard and it seems that right here you know in the the last few months of 2012 um, universally we're trying too hard and most of us are experiencing that on some individual level and in part it's because of that pressure we've applied to ourselves and others about the year 2012 and in part it's that um, it seems to be a reflection of the fact that the new way of being human um, doesn't include trying hard and being rewarded for it. <laughs> it includes being um, at peace and in love and being rewarded for it. And so um, that message has just become ubiquitous recently in the channelings I've been doing. And I do, you know, I do 12 to 15 channelings every week, including a few public channelings. And, um, and that message just pops up in all different corners. So that's an important one. Um, Another pattern I've seen recently is a suggestion that people uh, focus on one thing at a time. And this, I don't know exactly why this is popping up, but it's been popping up in, in a few different ways and with a different language, but that's my way of paraphrasing it. And I think part of that is... Um, because things are speeding up, however you want to say that, you know, even if you just want to stick to the human plane with the internet and CNN and the news, things are speeding up. We have too much information all the time. Um, but cosmically, things are speeding up too. And so there's a benefit in focusing on one thing at a time, um, even though we're comprehending more and we want to poke around and play with all that new information. Um, it seems that it serves all of us to do one thing at a time, um, whether it's washing the dishes or, you know, reading philosophy or meditating or, you know, we can do a really high level cosmic kind of thing if we want, but just do one at a time. You know, that reminds me of the, the Zen concept of mindfulness uh, very much, uh, where exactly as you say, whether you're washing the dishes or you're praying, you know, to apparently, you know, to, to put uh, all your focus, all your attention on that and just, you know, relax a little bit and, and focus on that, that, that one thing. And then I also hear what you're saying, you know, this concept of just being, which I think is, I know speaking personally can be difficult for me when, cause I'm kind of oriented towards doing, you know, I always want to do something and people and the the message of the time from that I that I hear a lot is no no stop doing and start just being, and um, I find that that's a real a real uh, at least for me a real challenge of this time. Um, oh, go ahead. I certainly relate to that. I have the same problem in my life. <laughs> um, how have you come to? understand this term that uh, that we hear more and more uh, Christ consciousness what is what does that mean to you uh, uh, through your work you know this is a question that people ask often in personal readings and I've done a few channelings on Christ consciousness itself because it's such an important thing and <sighs> I really like, I love channeling information about Christ consciousness. It's just a way of channeling about it. 
makes me happy. Um, so, you know, Christ consciousness, um, according to the records, is something that existed before this um before humanity modern human human times um but it does seem somewhat unique to this world so it's not one of those things that existed forever before this world began um but in some ways it's you could think of it as love shaped for this world you know shaped in a way that would be most useful for this world and um a shorthand interpretation of christ consciousness from the records is compassion uh but my experience of it in the records is so much twinklier than compassion somehow. <laughs> there's, a, there's a way that there's this sparkling, rippling love um, that's tangible. You know, love can be a really abstract concept. We talk about it all the time, but half the time we don't really know what we mean. Um, that, you know, there should be a million words for love because it is hard to talk about with just that single word. And when I access the records of Christ consciousness, what I feel is love, but it's got this particular quality of being, you know, um, maybe sort of like the difference between uh, the Amazon River and a babbling brook. It's more like a babbling brook, not in that it's smaller, but that it's more accessible. Um, it's easier to read. You can touch it. You can hear it. Um, you can You can play with it. And and um, so Christ consciousness was this energy that existed before Jesus Christ, the historical figure did. Um, but, you know, from what I've seen in the records, um, and mostly I've seen this in individual records of people who lived at that time or are participating in Christ consciousness. What I've seen is that um, that person, as well as um, hundreds of others, you know, his job was to channel, to kind of be a portal for the Christ consciousness into the world, to reawaken compassion in a more tangible way. And he did that. And then his words got twisted and turned a little bit, but that's just what people do. Uh, but the core of his role, that, that historic figure, Jesus Christ, and the role of everyone who feels deeply connected with Christ consciousness um, is to bring that into human lives to make love less abstract that you know in some ways it's sort of like christ consciousness is a very magical deep, big universal love into bites that humans can take you know and packages that humans can share with each other so uh, that seems to be the essence of Christ consciousness as I've seen it. It's got a lot more to it, but, but that's a good place to stop. <laughs> How can we then connect to our own uh, Christ consciousness? Mm -hmm. There are so many different ways, um, but because it's such a very human level version of love, um, it's best not to be too abstract about it. You know, um, there's no harm in meditating on Christ consciousness, but most of what I've seen in the records for, for Christ consciousness has to do with acts of compassion, you know, of giving to others, of empathizing with others, of trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Those kinds of everyday efforts seem to be the most direct line to get, you know, whoever you are, into Christ consciousness or vice versa. And so meditation is fine. Prayer is fine. All of those are good, but the really direct line seems to be much more tangible. It's not about feeling love in our hearts. It's about loving someone. You know, it's about seeing the little girl down the street and stopping, you know, to give her a hug or buy the lemonade she's selling. It's the, it's the gestures and the things where love becomes really potent. Um, and that's actually the magic of being human. You know, the keepers have never once in any way disparaged the human condition as much as it's limiting and painful. And we do such stupid things sometimes as humans, they, they kind of put us, but there's never anything disparaging because we have this ability to make love so potent. And we do that through our gestures. We do that one-to-one, -one, person to person or person to group, but you know, it's from one human to another. It's not a universal concept. It's, it's a reflection of the universal concept, but this is a beautiful thing we have the ability to do. Another reason not to rush through it. That's great. I'd like to turn the conversation now um, to another kind of human, and that's our star families. Some people call them ETs or aliens. But, but I've noticed that they, uh, and it's hard not to notice actually, that they are increasingly interested in events that are taking place uh, here on Earth, on, on this plane at this time. Um, wh why do you think that is? Why are they so darn interested in us? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think I think it's because we're interesting. <laughs> but I'll tell you more about um, what the records have shown about this. And I actually just did a did a channeling on extraterrestrial life this month, and that's going to be posted next month on my website. And so I've got some fresh information, like hot off the presses, uh, from about extraterrestrial life. Um, can, can can you give us a little uh, a little tease? You don't have to give it all, all away, but how about a little? <laughs> Plenty. The channeling is an hour long, so I could give it a lot and still not give it all away. <laughs> uh, but I'll first answer your question. Um, and that is to say that um, part of what makes us so interesting right now is, is this change we're going through. Um, it's never been done. As far as I've seen in the records, it's never been done in the universe for a group of beings to forget themselves as completely as, human, as the human race has and then to remember themselves without just twinkling into light. It's never been done um, to be able to maintain a physical existence and play with the illusion of separation without forgetting ourselves. You know, we, it's always been a, a prerequisite that we forget our full soul and our full records in order to experience separation. And so what human beings or humanity is attempting at this time to move through enlightenment and and remember our, more of our full selves while still being human, it's just never been done. So, the, um, you know, this is one of the first things I ever saw in the records, actually. You know, the first year I ever did channelings was... Um, I could see and comprehend through some question. I don't remember what it was now, but uh, really comprehend the, the fact that, that this world is standing room only at this point for both human beings and for spirits. Like everyone wants in on the action at different levels because it's such an odd and in some ways courageous thing to do. Um, it's not courageous in that our souls are at risk. We're not, but um, courageous in that it's just kind of crazy <laughs> that we're trying it. So in that sense, they're, they're, this this is a pretty crowded world at this point on a, on a spiritual level as well as a physical level. Um, but a couple of the other things that I saw in that uh, extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial channeling was um, more detail about how many different variations there are to the ways that extraterrestrials exist in this world. You know, everything from the way that ex extraterrestrial can, can, can come in as a spirit and then become embodied for a short period, to, can become a person for a short period or a dog for a short period in order to cross your path, all the way up to, you know, the classic spaceship landing. Um, but but uh, that what we learned is that at this point in time, most extraterrestrial life on planet Earth is not embodied in physical form. And the thing that makes that a spirit, an extraterrestrial rather than, a, than an Earth-based spirit, is that it's, um, you know, Earth-based spirits like our spirit guides and our ancestors and our loved ones, they're beings who have lived through human life or lived in this world, are committed to it, where what's happening is a lot of spirits spirits from across the universe. And I say spirits simply because they don't have bodies. Um, they're coming with a foreign perspective, um, you know, that sense of otherness. And therefore, they're bringing an energy that is other. And that that's really... Um, stimulating for the human mind. It's overwhelming. And some of the ways that people are experiencing feeling overwhelmed or um, having a hard time focusing in the last couple of years is in part just because there's a lot of energy around us that's not Mm, that we're not used to. It, it vibrates in ways or carries messages or holds energy that is, is foreign to the human experience and just feels different. And of course, um, as humans tend to do sometimes, when something uh, that we don't understand comes along, we get scared. And so, yeah, a lot of people... Um, get get afraid you know when they think about extraterrestrial life or when they sense something and they share that fear with others it gets passed around so that you know um the idea of extraterrestrial life has now become a a repository for lots and lots of collective fear and one of the reasons that the keepers encouraged me to do a reading on extraterrestrial life in the last couple of months is exactly because we can't afford to do that anymore you know the idea of et's um 
could be a place where people played with fear for a, for a long time because um, people are going to play with fear anyway. So why not do it there? <laughs> um, and and it just at this point, we've it, with 2012 and the shift that's happening, we can't afford to have that large of a repository for that intense kind of fear. So that it's so important that whether you're interested in, in ET life or not, it's so important that you just reframe it for yourself and consider what you're afraid of and try to think it through and choose something other than fear. And for some people, that's going to be a lot of work because they've been really wrapped up in the fear. And for some, they don't think about it much at all. But it's so important that we do that now. You've mentioned this activity on their part of, 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 of observing, you know, this, this shift that we're on. But do they, um, are, are they intended to play a more active role in um, ascension? Let's put it that way. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And just like with people, some ETs are totally here to help. And just like with people, some of them are here to make a mess of things. And so um, it, in some ways, the, the same mechanisms we use in our everyday lives to deal with other people, we can use with extraterrestrial life, whether we fully comprehend the being in the room with us or not. Um there are ways that we that we discern what feels right for us and what doesn't. There are ways that we hold boundaries or set intentions for what kind of kinds of people or energies we'll accept and, and which ones we won't. And so it's so important that we just take the lessons we've learned in our interpersonal lives with other people and we apply those to not only ETs, but um spirit beings as well. And so in that sense, even though the answer is yes, some are here to mess us up and some are here to help us, you don't always have to figure out exactly which one is doing what. Most of us don't have the ability to do that. And it could be a huge distraction to sit all day and try to figure out if there's an ET in the room. Um, but instead, just using that same sense of intention and that same sense of boundaries, you know, it's just so important for us to use good boundaries. Um, so, you know, that's where we have the power to help dictate or shape what will happen to us. And it's the same with ETs as it is with other people. You know, we, we were talking earlier about the vibration or frequency of, of love. And, and many of, of us here are searching for that, that kind of connection in the form of what some people call soulmates, or sometimes you hear the term twin flame. A recent guest on the show found his partner, in fact, a, a continent away uh, as he reached, uh, he was about 50 years old or so. So it took him a little while, you know, to, fi to find the one for him. Uh, what do the Akashic Records tell us about finding that, that level of connection? Oh, this is so interesting. I'm so glad you asked about that. Um... The, the thing I've seen recently in the Akashic Records that's really, I found personally so exciting um, and unforeseeable, I, had, I did not see this coming when I did a reading on soulmates a few months ago, is that uh, the, the contract that soulmates play in our lives is changing. So, the, and it, I guess it makes sense. If humans are changing and the way we work as humans is changing, um, of course, soulmates are changing too. So, you know, the former contract for what a soulmate is was more singular, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, um, if you had a soulmate contract with someone, that was your one and only soulmate. And therefore, you could build a whole romantic life around them and create a romantic partnership and live your lives together, um, live that romantic storyline, and it, it all fit. Um, the thing that's been changing slowly over time, but that change just accelerated massively in the last couple of years, is that all of our soulmates are being activated at the same time. So the way this works is that, you know, most of us, most humans on the planet have lived hundreds of lifetimes, if not more. So of course, we've been married to a bunch of different people. Of course, we've been in love with people. We've crossed paths with lots of people. So most of, most of us have dozens or hundreds of soulmates walking the planet. The old way of being human was that you'd only activate one soulmate contract so that you could find your one and only, and it'd be pretty simple. Um, what's happening is that all our soulmate contracts are activating at the same time. That doesn't mean you're supposed to marry a whole bunch of people. <laughs> That's okay. But um, what it means is that we're meant to learn how to fall in love without romance and sex. We're meant to connect with others and recognize that deep soul connection and that pure love and kind of falling for someone. You know, you're so excited to see them. You see the beauty in them. They make you a better person. 
regardless of what your interpersonal relationship is. It could be the, the, your neighbor's daughter and the way you always smile and wave at each other. It could be someone much older, much younger, um, all sorts of different people are, are your soulmates. And so one of the really important, um, kinds of work that people are doing on a spiritual level at this time is sorting out the ways that we carry um, romantic trauma, sexual trauma um, from previous lifetimes and from our culture, the way, you know, the, the way that we bombard ourselves with, with a lot of confusing messages about those things. It's so important that we sort that out for ourselves individually so that we can be open to letting ourselves fall for somebody, even though we're never going to have a sexual relationship or we're never going to be romantic with them. And so what's becoming possible? And I, I hear a lot of people asking questions that tells me tell me that they're trying this, is that you can choose someone to be a life partner. You can marry them or live with them if you'd like or not. Um, and yet you can still come home one day and say, I just met the most wonderful person. Let me tell you about them. And it's no longer on the table, a question of whether that threatens your marriage. It's not relevant because you that's not what you're deciding to do every time you feel love. <laughs> and so um, that's been a really exciting thing to see. And it was just mind boggling for me to see the vast uh, expansion of what happens when all your soulmate contracts are activated in one lifetime. The possibility for how much love we could feel and how excited we could be about other people is almost infinite. And it's if, if people could really tap into that, I think the world would be healed, basically. So, Jen, you've taken a quite extensive look and multiple looks into the uh, Akashic Records, but I'm curious to know what struck you the most? What was the most interesting or exciting or engaging thing that you found in there? Uh, there are so many things, uh, but there's one thing I saw years ago and then it pops up every now and then. And each time I'm astounded that I don't share this with everyone all the time. And it is that, uh, the keepers have described the, the way humans are built in regard to love and we are built needing love and we're built needing to share love. And the average human is built with, um, a capacity for giving love that is 10 times greater than our capacity for needing love. Meaning that, you know, in, in most of our lives, we get hurt. And so we ended up, end up feeling like we have a deficit for love and we end up looking for love, searching for it, trying to get it, trying to feel like we're being loved. When in fact, our, our capacity to love others is so much greater than what we need that if we if we'll just focus more on loving others, finding things to love in other people, the, um, the opening that capacity immediately fills what we need. And there are a lot of things in religions that kind of point to that fact. And it was just so amazing to see, you know, when I see something in the records, I can see. I can see it clearly, you know, as reality and to just see for a fact, like it looked like a scientific fact, you know, like a tip of the iceberg kind of thing that what we need from others in terms of love is so small compared to how deeply we need to love others. And so that's probably my favorite thing. Wow. Well, I'd like to share some some exciting news that, that I have and perhaps the viewers are already aware of it, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, the uh, Soul Adventure TV is now also available in audio podcast format through iTunes. So this would include all of our past shows. They're already up. And, of course, every future show that we do, including this one, will be uh, available in first in video uh, format, but then as an audio podcast. If you're not familiar with what audio podcasts are, they're, they're a great free way to take Soul Adventure TV or any other program, for that matter, with you and to automatically receive each new ep episode as soon as they are released. So please visit the iTunes Store section and enter Soul Adventure TV in the search box, and you'll find the program there, and you can subscribe to it. Of course, again, it's totally totally free, and it's a great way to uh, to enjoy the program. So uh, with, with that, uh, Jen, is there anything uh, going on that you would like uh, to uh, promote, any uh, uh, event or uh, something maybe to do with your website? or What's up with you? 
Absolutely. You know, there's a lot going on, and most of it can be found on my website. Uh, my website is akashictransformations.com, and uh, there you'll find an events calendar. As I mentioned earlier, I do a public channeling once a month, sometimes more, and it's always on a topic that's given to me by the keepers, um, but those topics are also suggested by members, and um, if a lot of people are interested in the same thing at the same time, I'll often do a channeling on that as well. And so I'll be doing a channel on the year 2013 in October this year. And then you can look forward to next year where I'll do a channeling on the following year. So that's something you'll see each year. But for now, look at that events calendar to see some of the topics we'll be doing. Um, on my website, you can also find channelings on each month each week and each day. So it's a great way to engage in getting a little bit of information about what what the Akashic records have built for the day. And then you can decide what to tap into based on what's collectively there in the records. So I try to offer that as a way to bring the Akashic records into your everyday life more. And so you'll find those things and quite a, quite a lot of other things on my website. So feel free to visit at akashictransformations.com. Uh, thank you again, Jen, for being so generous with your time, for sharing your insights, and experiences with our audience. As always, we invite viewers to leave comments, questions, guest recommendations on the Soul Adventure TV website or on YouTube or Facebook. And please, please, please feel free to share this video. Uh, this information is meant for everyone. So until next time, this is Steve Crow, your host, wishing you an enlightening and fulfilling Soul Adventure. Bye-bye, Jen. Bye.